Hi everybody, it's Luke from Cocos. In the last four videos, I introduced the basic working principles of WebGL and how to use WebGL to draw. In the next few videos will mainly take you through the process of how to apply it in Cocos Creator 3.x. In the previous video, we used WebGL to draw a rectangle. So how do you draw the same rectangle in Cocos Creator? This is the goal of this video. It is to show you how Cocos Creator makes it easy for users to, cust to customize with multi-layer packaging for internal functions, so users can assemble according to their needs. Therefore, we only need to know how to assemble the relevant parts, the drawing process of the rectangle. So we can split the content into the following parts. The first is the data preparation section, that is to provide vertex data. In the previous case, we provided fixed data directly. There are many places to provide vertex data in Cocos Creator 3. For example, 2D rendering components, sprites, graphics, and in 3D models, components like mesh renderer, skin mesh renderer, and others can provide vertex data. Of course, users can also customize their vertex data. Since this part involves rendering pipelines in the underlying engine, it's beyond the scope of our video series, so we won't get into detail about it. The second is the canvas clear phase. This part is related to the camera. Because the game scene is often a lot of objects, has a lot of objects, but the actual picture presented is only a small part of it, the presented part is what is in the camera's view. Since we only have one screen, so it's up to the camera to decide whether to erase the previous content or redraw it, or continue to draw on the original content. The third part is the coloring instruction section. This part is similar to the writing of a vertex and a slice effect text. In Cocos 3.x, you can implement through Cocos Effect. Here, I'll start with the very basics of how a component graphics draws graphics. Let's take a look at the process. First, let's create a new scene. Then, let's click on the Hierarchy Manager panel. And let's create a 2D object with graphic nodes. Create a script named Draw, and let's mount it on the graphics node. Then let's call the graphics drawing related interface. Let's get the graphics components. And then let's call the interface to draw a rectangle. This is where we draw a 400 by 300 rectangle. Let's run it and take a look. You can see that we've drawn a 400 by 300 white rectangle on the screen. The entire drawing process here has several parts in the figure. The first is the text provided by Coco's effect. Because graphics is a built-in component, so you'll need to view the engine source code. You can open a built-in engine directory and find the graphics component. In this, we can see a built-in ResMGR. This is the built-in resource management module. We went into this module and found UI graphics material. You can see that it uses an effect named graphics, and it mounts it to a new material. We can also include it in the built-in resources directory. Find this effect built-in graphics in the effects folder. Uh, this is because the engine layer will exclude the prefix built-in from the resources. So you just saw the engine's code. It uses the name graphics just directly to get the effect. With the effect and the material, let's take a look at the vertex data now. The vertex data is provided in this section. First of all, when we first execute the drawing instructions, the graphics component creates a buffer. This buffer is from the CPU. Then we call it when drawing the interface, it will fill it with data. It'll populate it. And the process is in a graphics assembler. The data assembly module for graphics components. Now, we'll perform related data fill instructions, and then the final judgment will be made, and the data will be updated. 
Then resubmit this data if there are updates. The vertex data provided here is based on a model space. These operations are completed in the engine. So we don't need to worry about this. Another part that is relevant to us is the camera. You can see that the graphics node we built in the beginning creates a canvas node. This is the 2D management node. Then at the same time, a camera node will be created underneath. The camera node has a camera component on it, and graphics will be rendered to the screen. It must be combined with the camera component to render correctly. The binding condition is the, the layer property of the graphics. Remember this layer? It belongs to UI2D. The camera has a property called visibility. This attribute must be corresponding to the graphics layer. This graphics can only be rendered to the screen. And you can see that currently the camera's visibility classifications contain UI3D and UI2D. If it doesn't contain UI2D, let's take a look. This time it doesn't contain UI2D. Let's refresh it again. You can see that the white rectangle is not drawn on our screen. This is because the camera does not include the classification of the graphics node. So this node will not be rendered by this camera. So let me restore it. All right, let me refresh. Okay, the correct rendering. Then I'll summarize a few parts that developers need to care about. The first is the shader. The relationship between the shader and the Cocos effect. The second is the material. The third is the camera. You need to apply them to the object that will provide the vertex data. And the custom vertex part is relatively more complicated. So let's not talk about that at this time. And the previous part about calling the GL interface is handled in the engine. So we don't need to do it manually. Unless you want to customize the engine. After understanding the base drawing process where the vertex data is coming from, then we'll start writing the shader. The shader corresponds to Cocos Creator 3X by the Cocos Effect. The Cocos Effect is a single source embedded domain specific language based on YAML and GLSL. YAML section declares the flow list control list and the GLSL section declares the actual coloring fragment. These two parts are complemented to each other together to constitute a complete rendering process description. The engine will perform the corresponding rendering according to the description. It is important to note that Cocos Effect cannot be used alone and needs to match with the material it's used. So let's take a look at the YAML first. YAML is a serialized language. It is also understood to be a language focused on writing profiles. Cocos Creator takes full effect of the parser of YAML 1.2 standard. YAML is completely compatible with JSON's writing. So JSON can be used and seen as a subset of YAML. YAML is a combination of keys separated by colons and spaces. It has several common ways of writing. The first one is all quotes and commas and can be omitted as shown in this figure. The second one is a number of space indent numbers that represent data. Object 1 represents hierarchy 1 and object 2 represents hierarchy 2. The third is to indicate array elements with even characters and spaces. For example, write it like this. Finally, it will be parsed into an array of JSON format at the bottom of engine. The fourth way is to define a template. You can define an anchor star to reference. Set the structure of the object 1 into the template to use the key 3 or object 2. The final parse JSON format is shown above. The fifth is a similar inheritance to the add to the less than or less than symbol. Or set object 1 as a template, object 2 as a key 3 to object 1 template. The final parse JSON format is shown in this figure. The above part is only listed in the development of Coco's effect. To learn more, please refer to the YAML official website. Okay, you've learned how to write in YAML format and how to write in GLSL. So, let's take a look at how writing something within Coco's Effect. Coco's Effect mainly has two parts. One is a list of rendering processes edited by CC Effect using YAML format. The content of the columns here mainly involves interacting with the editor. For developers to perform data adjustments in the editor and interact with CC program. Cocos Effect's core is a technique rendering technology. Technique rendering technology representatives complete the final effect. A solution can have one or more passes fused to complete. One pass is one GPU draw. 
It generally includes a vertex shader and a fragment shader. Each vertex of the fragment shader has to declare its own entry function and provide a return value. The return value of this entry function will be provided to the entry function of the run platform. That is the main function we used before. The other is the color fragment based on the CC program based GLSL 300ES format. You can see from this image the picture shows the shader writing of a GPU drawn. The drawing is a rectangle from the previous video. Among them, a shader pair is defined in the first array in the Cocos Effect Pass array. Each shader pair points to the entry function defined in CC program. The final entry function returns value passes the receiving object of the opposite shader pair. For example, the vertex shader passes to the GL position piece shader to pass to the GL frag color. The vertex shader receives two vertex attributes when drawing the base element. One is a position and one is a color, and the pass to the color to the film shader. It's all covered in the previous rendering knowledge, and it's easy to understand, right? Of course, there is a place to note here. Coco's Creator 3 uses a format of the GLSL ES300 to write shader fragments, so subsequent input and outputs use in out keywords. So instead of an attribute of varying like the old version, of course, if you want to continue using it, it's still compatible. Next, we analyze it as an example of built in graphics. First, create an effect called graphics in the resource panel. Then, find built in graphics. Copy all the contents to the newly created graphics. And then we can analyze the content here. Let's look at the first one first. Pass defines a pair of shaders, including the vertex shader and a fragment shader. Because we only draw one, so as long as you define a shader pair, if we want to add a stroke to the rectangle, so this time you can add a pass to draw the contents of the strokes. Both the vertex and the fragment shaders defined here need to point to the entry function of the shader defined by CC program. Like blend state, raster size state, and depth stencil state are related to mixing and testing. This is temporarily ignored. This part of the content will be put in the final information about the extension. The reason for setting here is because the engine provides a set of default tests in mixing configurations. But in 2D, due to its current design, no depth test is required. So you need to change the configuration manually. So we just keep the configuration here. Next, let's look at the definition of a shader. The shaders are defined by the CC program, where the VS is the name of the vertex shader. The names of defined here need to correspond to the names of the vertex shaders used in CC effect pass. Let's look at the first line first. The first line represents the definition of all floating point precision in the vertex shader. It is precision. So the next two include representative code snippets that need to be introduced into Cocos Creator 3. Projection matrix and observation matrix are provided to CC Global. CC Local provides the model matrix. These two sections will be discussed later. Further down are the three input vertex property data and the data passed to the fragment shader, including position, color, and dist. What is dist? Well, it deals with the parameter provided by the anti-aliasing function. We don't need to worry about it. So let's look further down at the entry functions. The difference between the previously mentioned content is more than a coordinate conversion. Let's take a look at this part of the content. I don't know if you still remember, the vertex data provided by graphics in Cocos Creator 3.x is from the model space. However, the final output of the vertex shader is cropped space. So we need to let the vertices switched from the model space to crop space. Let's see this picture first. This picture clearly tells us how the vertex coordinates are converted from the model space to the screen final output. In the real world, our description of all the directions is with a coordinate system. For example, we go to the office we, to do business. The attendant at the door tells us which room number to go to. Here describes the gate as the origin of the coordinates. For example, if your friend has a piece of rice on their face while they're eating, at this point, it's not so easy to describe where it is. We usually will use the face as the origin and tell them where the rice is around their mouth. The relative here is the model space. Here's another real-world situation. 
Passerbys will tell us to go north or south. This kind of description is based on the center of the world as the origin, which can also be described as the absolute path. Of course, I know some of these examples may not work for you, but the main thing is that you can understand what it means. The world space used to describe the scene in Coco's Creator. All objects are under the world space. Therefore, the model space is converted to the world space, and the model transform matrix needs to be used. In the end, it's actually similar to the scene seen by the human eye. In the game, it's used to simulate the camera. Objects are seen within the camera's viewing cone, are ignored outside the viewing cone. The relationship between the camera and the object is not described in the model space. Therefore, you need to use the world space to calculate. Finally, you convert objects to observation space. What you need to use here is the observation matrix. Eventually, the contents of the observation space need to be mapped to crop coordinates. That is, the coordinates under the observation space are converted between negative 1 and 1. The projection matrix is used here. The final perspective culling is performed by the GPU to cull vertices that are outside the coordinate boundaries. So here, we have to gone through the following transformations. The model transform matrix, observation matrix, projection matrix are three transform operations. Models in Cocos Crater usually vertex data are model space coordinates. 2D, like sprite and label, for example, due to the large number of such objects and high frequency of changes. Therefore, model space coordinates are sent to the CPU to reduce GPU computing overhead on the CPU. As a side note here, because the relationship between standardized device coordinates and screen coordinates, we end up with a crop coordinate in the Vertex shader. A transformation is performed on the GPU to convert the crop coordinates to normalized device coordinates. The final output is converted to screen coordinates. The normal device coordinates are the x-axis going to the right and the y-axis going up. The values of x and y is negative 1 to 1. The vertices in the range are visible. Just like the picture on the left, and the screen coordinates are on the y-axis to the right and the x-axis going down. The value of the x and the y is from 0 to screen width. The final step in the matrix transformation is to convert the normalized device coordinates to screen coordinates and display them on the screen. The screen coordinates might be difficult to understand, so study up. Moving on, let's look at the fragment shader composed of FS. It is the fragment shader. It is the first line of the low version of the processing scheme. Most devices now support higher versions, but some older devices support lower versions, so we don't have to worry about this. Further down are accuracy statements. This part is better understood with the vertex shader. Then, there are two inputs passed in by the vertex shader. Further down is the entry function for the fragment shader. Eliminate the part about the low version and the anti-aliasing. In fact, it is very clear that the final value of the output is actually from the color value input. Right, so let's cut it out. So we can make some changes to the above, delete parts that we don't need, and parts that we need we can save. Uh, let's delete this. Now, a dist still needs to be preserved here in the vertex input property declaration because on the input side of the vertex property of the data, it will pass the data. And if we delete it, it will cause a data mismatch. This part can be deleted. Uh, delete this version uh, to determine this part. And let's then delete this process of dist. So we're almost here. So you understand, right? Except for the one part which is not covered, both are exactly the same as the vertex shader and the fragment shader that we talked about originally. But there is more coordinates to convert in this layer. The last part is about the camera. When we create a canvas node, you will see a camera node by default. Camera node's camera component comes with three properties, clear flags, clear color, and rect corresponding to the WebGL's viewport, GL clear, and GL clear color, where clear flags represents the data that needs to be cleared. Solid underscore color represents the clearing of all buffer data. Contains our previous color buffer, color underscore buffer underscore bit. There's still a depth buffer, template buffer, and other things. And two parts like depth underscore only and don't underscore clear. We'll continue to talk about these later on in the series.
gl.clearColor corresponds to clear color property. It is a request what color to fill after clearing the screen content. Rec defines the screen space viewport. X and Y value limit is negative 1 to 1, and the WH value limit is 0 to 1. These four values will eventually multiply the canvas size. Next, I'll look into the application of Rect in a different project. I'll change it so it will be more convenient for you to see. Select the camera node to see the picture presented by the camera in the lower right corner of the scene editor. We treat the whole picture as a photo that will be better understood. X and Y is the offset of the photo of the, on the canvas, and the WH represents the size of the photo in the canvas. It will be better understood in this practical application. I'm setting it here as negative 0.5. I want the entire photo to move away to the left. Let's go ahead and let's take a look. It looks like I moved the picture of the canvas half to, of the way to the left. So now you can only see half of the character. Then let's go back and restore it. And instead, let's actually change the width to 0.5. At this time, the size of the photo is only half of the original size. Okay, let's take a look. As you can see, although it is presented in the left-hand position, this time the character is not cropped. So, keep the center of the camera and the crop on both sides. This is how X, Y, and WH are set. This is the effect that the setting parameters ha will have on the final image of the area covered by the camera. At this point, we have a general understanding of how to get the vertex data for a basic drawing component, graphics, and its shader content. In the next chapter, we will analyze 2D rendering component of the texture map processing on the basis of the basic drawing shader sprite and some modifications. So, we'll see you in the next one.